it's another day and I'm going to continue this project again. I'm going to start out by making a couple of notes here. Some people might be aware that Briggs & Stratton Vanguard engines, the one that I have here, aren't made in Japan anymore. This one was a, uh, an old stock that they were trying to get rid of, so they sold it for really cheap. So this build date, uh, 1008. Uh, this one is still old enough that it was a Japanese design, not the newer ones. I really wanted a Honda engine for this project, but those were expensive, so ended up with this instead. And I also wanted to mention this coupling. When I started this project, I had done a fair amount of research on belt drive applications, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but uh, belt drive doesn't work out all that great for this sort of application, and I thought that this jaw type coupling would. However, the last uh, day or so, I actually looked up the engineering perspective on jaw couplings, and it is not a very good solution for this application, unfortunately. They are not designed, this uh, L-type jaw coupling is not designed for use in reciprocating applications, whether it's the power source that's reciprocating in a piston engine, or the load that's reciprocating if you're driving an air compressor. The spider in here tends to uh, overheat and you can get vibrations, uh, harmonic vibrations that damage either your power source or your load. So I don't know if this is going to work very well, but I'm going to give it a try. The basic mechanical setup is done, now it's time for the electrical portion of it. And a lot of people like to put their battery directly onto the platform that the generator is on. I don't like that approach because these things tend to vibrate a lot. I don't care how smooth the small engine you get, it's still going to have a lot of vibration compared to what a vehicle would have. And batteries are not designed for that sort of vibration. So they don't last nearly as long. They tend to drool acid all over the place and it just gets to be really messy. So I don't want my battery on this thing. I want it somewhere nice and stable on the ground. So I'm going to set it next to this and connect and disconnect the battery each time I want to use this setup. It's important to note that an alternator like this, you cannot disconnect from a battery while it's running or you very well may destroy your alternator. So it needs to be permanently tied. For that reason, I'm not using alligator clamps or anything. I'm using ring terminals like this. That way I can be sure to hook it up, start it up, and they won't come loose during operation. Now, some of you who subscribe may actually recognize this. These cables that I'm going to use is a Cobra cable kit that I had mentioned in my Cobra inverter review. There's a lengthy review on that out there, but uh, I knew that I would get a chance to use these at some point, and that point's going to be now. They are four gauge cables, 10 feet long, negative and a positive, and I'm just going to use these. That allows me to put my battery bank a fair distance away from this. Now, normally, it's best to keep your cables as short as possible especially when you're talking high currents, 100 amps or so from this. Uh, I'm planning on running it at about 80, actually. However, <clears throat> in this particular case, it really doesn't hurt the operation of this generator to run longer cables. And that's because the field current in this alternator is limited by the battery voltage at the output terminal. So if this alternator is outputting 15 volts, but its regulator is, is approximately set to, this will be able to output, we'll say, 100 amps at some certain condition. Now, if I tie this very directly to a battery with a nice, hard, very short, thick cable, it is going to pull the alternator output down to battery voltage. It might be 12 volts. I might be drawing 100 amps out of the battery bank. There may be six batteries all in parallel that uh, take quite a bit of current to charge. So this will pull, it would pull this down to, we'll say, 12 volts and now you lost maybe about 15% of your amperage out of your alternator because it's only putting 12 volts across that uh, field. <clears throat> the rotor has a... The rotor generates the magnetic field, the rotating magnetic field, and it would just send 12 volts then across it, and you'd get a drop in amperage. So if I have a longer cable and I get half a volt of drop in my cable, that actually helps increase the output of this. So it improves the performance. It doesn't decrease it. So I don't really care if I have long cables for that reason. Now, it will consume more gasoline if I have loss in the cables, but I'm not too worried about that in this case. It's pretty minor anyway. And these are 10 feet long. I don't want to cut them, so I'm just going to leave them. I'm also going to put in these fuses. I uh, stole these off of a, well, salvaged 
these off of a old UPS unit. They're 60 amp fuses, so I'm just going to put two in parallel. That way if the alternator shorts out <coughs> or the diode rectifiers fail and end up draining my battery instead of charging it, I don't ruin my entire battery bank. And it's not a fire hazard. So I'm going to put that in there and then I just have some miscellaneous hardware and wiring and connectors and such. So I'm going to try to connect those up here and we'll see what I come up with. One more note on these jaw couplings. This coupling that I got from the Epicenter, they obviously did not do their engineering work and I would not recommend getting this one in retrospect. But this insert that they sold, this is a rubber insert and it's only rated for up to 1750 RPMs. So it is the improper insert for this application. Uh, just thought I would note that. But I'm going to use it and see what happens. If you use this at too high an RPM, you get a risk of overheating and it can actually melt. But We'll see what happens when I fire it up. Here's the largely completed wiring. I need to secure things down a little bit better to make this permanent, but this is good enough for testing. So I actually fused the ground just because it worked out better on this one. I'm not going to be setting this in a vehicle where it may contact the chassis or anything, so that'll work just as, just as well as fusing positive. Have them hooked up to these four gauge cables through uh, whatever these are called. The negative goes through the fuses to this connector and out. Positive just comes straight out the alternator. What's more interesting is this connection terminal back here. There's a one and a two on a three wire alternator. The reference terminal, you could wire all the way out to your battery, but in this case, this alternator is set at too high voltage anyway. So I would like some voltage drop in the cables. That would actually be beneficial. So I'm leaving it open. If you leave it open, it just internally references the output terminal. The number two terminal has to be connected to some sort of electrical source in order to power the field. So I have that connected up to a momentary switch. And I can just push this to uh, turn on the alternator. So basically I start the engine, it won't be generating. I push the switch and then it'll be generating. As long as the engine remains, remains uh, on, it will grab its field power from the output of the alternator, so you don't need a connection. As soon as the engine shuts off, runs out of fuel, if, I'm not, if it's unattended, that sort of thing, then the field will shut down, as long as this is a momentary switch. That's why I chose to use momentary instead of a toggle switch. Because if you use a toggle switch and the engine quits, then it starts draining your battery. Now you can connect a resistor or something up in here. Um, I'm not doing that. This is just full field current. Don't do that if you use a toggle switch because if it stays closed, the coil inside will burn itself up without a, some sort of limiting device, a lamp or a resistor or something. Uh, but this is the easiest way to do it. You can't do it this way in an automotive system because you would have a run-on condition. If you connect it directly up to your ignition switch, this actually feeds out of the alternator then um, into your ignition and then you can't shut your car off. So that's the way they don't do it that way, but I can safely do it this way in this setup. But there is one more thing I'd like to add to this before I get ready to fire it up. And that additional item is my tachometer and hour meter. I bought this kind of as a toy to play around with on my lawnmower and on this project because I want to run this at 2500 RPMs and this will tell me what RPMs it's running at. It'll also tell you how many hours it's been running, which is kind of nice. It uh, is battery powered, supposedly lasts three years. It's about the cheapest one out there. So we'll see how it works, but and then you just wrap this wire around the plug wire and it inductively couples. And that's the basic setup that I have. Uh, certainly not too fancy and it's somewhat temporary. I'll have to tie this stuff down better eventually if I like this setup and if it works. But oh, and then one more thing up here. It does have a, an adjustment screw in this engine so you can change the uh, maximum throttle setting pretty easily just by turning the screw in and out. So the tack is also nice for that. I can set it so that full speed is 2500 RPMs instead of 3600, how it's probably set now. I'm pretty well ready to fire up my prototype setup here, but first I should probably put some oil in it. Now I'm not one of those synthetic oil fanboys out there. I don't actually use synthetic in any of my vehicles and there's reasons for it that I'm not going to get into, but I do have some peeves when it comes to people and engine oil. It's 
seems to be kind of a religion rather than a science, especially on the internet. And I have two general rules that I try to follow when it comes to oil to get good information. One of them is, if anybody ever tells you you should not use synthetic oil in some situation, ignore everything else they have to say about oil because they don't understand it. There was a time in, in the past where certain synthetics were made through a different process and they caused uh, incompatibilities and seals and such, but that's not the case anymore. There's never any reason you cannot use synthetic, included in the break-in period. And number two, if anybody ever tells you to use straight weight oil, there are certain situations where you can get by with using a straight weight oil, but in general, it's just a bad idea to do. If you live in Florida, go ahead. It's not gonna hurt anything. But if you live around where I do, where it gets cold, especially in equipment like this, where you may want to run it when it's cold, always use a winter weight oil. Now, the reasons that people say that, I might as well quick mention, a 5W30, they start with a five weight oil, uh, five winter weight. Uh, the actual numbers, number scales on this one and this one are different. But they start with a, a lighter base stock, and they put in viscosity improvers, so that when it gets hot, you have the appropriate viscosity, otherwise it would be way too thin. 10W30 actually does lubricate better in engines that run hot. But my recommendation is just don't use this in an air-cooled engine. Don't use a regular oil. Use synthetic because they run hotter. If you use synthetic, you can use basically any weight you want. I would recommend against 0W, but anything else is just fine. So I can use this, however, because I'm going to be draining the oil on a short drain interval the first time, I'm not going to waste my money. I'm just going to put in cheap oil. and. After that, then I'll start using synthetic in it. I think this one takes one and a half quarts, something like that. Uh, quite a bit more than most others because it is a commercial engine. But uh, I'll put oil in it and a little bit of gas and we'll see what happens when I fire it up. One more note on straight weight oils, ones that don't have a W in them. Another reason that some people say to use those is because they have a different additive package and that is usually true. This here, you can see that it is uh, API service grade SN. A lot of times they're not an API grade. So they can put whatever they want in them, including nothing. And that's really bad. <laughs> uh, so just make sure that you get good oil. Make sure that it has an API service rating on it, and you'll be fine. I was quick looking through the manual to see approximately how much oil this engine was going to take. And I noticed that they had some pretty good notes on engine oil. Use a high quality detergent oil, classified by API as such or higher. And they also mentioned that you can buy Briggs & Stratton 30 weight in API grade, which is interesting, more on that later. Synthetic oil is an acceptable oil at all temperatures. However, it does not change required oil change intervals. Uh, that's for warranty purposes. It actually does last longer, but they just want to make sure you change your oil. Air-cooled engines run hotter than automotive engines. The use of non-synthetic multi-viscosity oils, 5 or 10 for example, in temperatures above 40 C will result in higher than normal oil consumption and check the oil level more frequently. So they say that, yeah, you can use it, but the oil won't last as long. And that's true. That's why I say just use synthetic. It's the best oil for air-cooled engines. Straight weight 30 oil, if used below 40 Fahrenheit, will result in hard starting and possible engine bore damage due to inadequate lubrication. So. Why the heck would you use it? Just buy synthetic. That'll work in all temperatures and last the longest. And uh, down here, my engine actually takes 0.7 liters, so it's a little bit less oil than I was thinking. Well, it appears that this alternator from DB Electrical is some sort of hybrid. It's not a true one-wire alternator, nor is it a true three-wire alternator. On a standard Delco Remy three-wire alternator, if you turn the switch on and keep it there, it will send full field current through the field windings and eventually burn it up if the engine isn't running, if the fan's not turning. In this one, with the engine stopped, even with this, 
button pressed in, it still runs no current, at least not a, a very low amount, through the field windings. But I have to hold this in in order for it to run, even with the engine running. So I'll just change this with a toggle switch instead of a momentary switch, and we should be good to go. It does seem to generate. I haven't really tested it beyond that.